feel more awesome than I know all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more
like I know a friend I want to know you, Lord I want to know you, Lord Like I know a friend I want to know you, Lord So I'm laying down all my religion. I'm laying down. Wanna know you, Lord? I'm laying down all my religion.
of me Said your love got a hold of me I'm a new creation I'm forever changed Said your love got a hold of me Said your love got a hold of me I'm a new creation I'm forever changed Said your love got a hold of me Since your love got a hold of me I'm a new creation I'm forever changed Since your love got a hold of me Since your love got a hold of me I'm a new creation I'm forever changed Thank you, you see you. Amen. Ms. Victoria. Roll that beautiful bean footage, as Nick would say. Beneath the waves, there is an underwater world where things look very different once we get below the surface. Captain, now there's the school of giant jellyfish attaching themselves to the sub. Captain, the engines are failing. Captain, there's an octopus in your cabin. Dive deep, Mr. Avery. Make way for the forgotten sea. This summer, we're taking you to the depths of the ocean. We'll dive deep, submerging ourselves in God's word and discovering what God sees in us. Things aren't always as they seem. Jesus saw people for who they were on the inside, not just who they appeared to be. This summer, we want to see ourselves as Jesus sees us. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there's any offensive way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. Each day, we gather at the helm to get submerged in fun and uplifting worship. Down, 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 we're diving down, down deep. Then it's off to the observation station for action-packed Bible study, where we'll take an in-depth look at how Jesus saw others. After that, we'll swim through rotation sites in the deep sea and experience crafts, music, missions, and more. And all this fun is centered on learning about Jesus and that we all need a savior. Even those of us who look like we have it all together. Mr. Avery, stop your playing with the octopus. This summer is going to be an adventure. Our relationship with Christ changes everything. Come join us. All you have to do is dive in. Submerge! All right, guys. Are y'all excited about that? That oh, couldn't be any more exciting. Are you kids ready? Now, last week I got a pretty poor response. Let's see if I do any better this week. Kids, are you ready for VBS? I don't, I don't think so, guys. Are y'all ready for VBS? I hear this side. How about this side? Are y'all ready for VBS? Oh. <laughs> Cambria, a little louder. <laughs> they didn't hear you over there. All right, guys. We are one week away, okay? So we got a lot of things coming up. Saturday, we got decorating day. That's the first thing we got to do is decorate this place and Put it underwater. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to start at 9 o'clock. 
If you're not involved in anything else in VBS, that's a great way to help. Just come out, have a good time. We're going to decorate the rooms, decorate the sanctuary, decorate everywhere. So 9 o'clock till we're done. we got to try to get out of here quick as we can that Saturday morning, okay? Family night. It'll start off at, at 5 o'clock Sunday. Please bring a couple plates of cold food. <laughs> we know it's in the gym. It's going to be warm. Don't bring your hot spicy chili, okay? Bring some cool stuff for you, some cold sandwiches, just something good, just something finger food, quick we can eat. Kids are going to have a fun surprise that night I've got lined up. So we're going to have a good time. So bring that. Now the last thing, today is the last day to order your pretty little yellow shirt. So sign up. It's still out there. I'm going to pull it up after church service so I can get them in by next week. And guess what? Keep signing up because what happens now? Rose. Woohoo, we get a prize. We're going to get rid of all our prizes this year. So I'm going to pick five names. If they're not here, they're still going to get the prize. We're just picking five names. We'll put it in the thing and make sure they get their prize. And whatever's left on family night, we'll pick the rest of it, okay? So you ready, Freddie? Got my little treasure box. Don't pick your own name. That's not, that'd be the first one you pick, right? We got Kane Lee. And I know he's not here, so we'll put him aside. Shake it up, shake it up. We got Carissa Wilbanks. Come on up and see Miss Elizabeth. She's got the bag over here. All right, pick you another one. Lakota Gatlin. Over there, Carissa. Come on, Lakota. Woohoo. Two more. We got Elizabeth Slayton. How'd she get in there? <laughs> over there, Lakota. And we got Collins Gentry, and we'll make sure he gets one too. So, all right, thank y'all. We'll see y'all next Sunday. Keep signing up. All right, I got just a few more things I want to tell you about and read to you before we get into our message this morning. <clears throat> I do want to remind everybody that um, we're still having our, our small groups and that's going very well. It's kicked off and we're actually adding to it. Uh, it's, it's going exactly like we're hoping for it to go. So um, if, it, if the reason why we don't have a Sunday night service is so that we can have some more personal gatherings together in smaller groups uh, to develop relationships and nurture each other's faith. If um, if you wanted to be a, a bigger part of this body of believers, this is one of the best ways. Find you one of these small groups to get involved with. We got them for men. We got them for women. We got them for marriages. We got them for, um, for singles. We've got them for whatever case you be in. There's several to choose from. Um, I would encourage you to come and see me or Brother Nick, either one. We'd love to try to point you in a direction or at least let you look at one. And if you decide to do it, that would be a great way to develop some relationships and just get involved with the church and what the church is doing. Um, I also want to remind you, as you probably saw on the screen, we do need some help with the nursery. Uh, if that's something that you'd be willing to, to get on a schedule with, I think they try to rotate that out and, um, and get that um, to where as much as possible, um, as long as everybody shows up, and that's what's hard about it today. As long as everybody shows up, we try to keep this schedule to where uh, it, you don't have to do it all the time. It just rotates out. So the more people that can come in and be committed to it, the better. And then um, next Sunday, we've got a special guest speaker that is going to be with us. Uh, he's not actually a guest, but um, I think you'll be very pleased to, to hear what he has to say. And uh, so I'm not going to tell you who that is right now, but I encourage you to come. And uh, just uh, make sure you're here next Sunday morning to, um, to hear our speaker of, of the hour. And then July 24th, of course, as you saw, we got uh, Brother Nate Brady that's coming from Guatemala. And um, so Nate is um, originally from Kentucky, but he lives in Guatemala and he's been there, I think, for four or five years now. And they have a wonderful growing ministry there in Guatemala. And they are who we are connected with to get in the village at Buena Vista. They actually minister and train pastors all over Guatemala and Mexico. 
but they connected us with Buena Vista and Nate will be here to tell you more about what their ministry does. So I encourage you to make sure that the next two Sundays, if you can be here, make a special effort to be here. Um, both of them are going to be very special Sundays and very informational for, um, for what this church is trying to do and what they're trying to support. And then last but not least, I've got a, um, a few thank you cards to read. It says, WBC family, thank you for your thoughts and gifts upon my graduation. You all have been a blessing to me, and for that I am forever grateful. Love, Cody Kimbra. And then I got another thank you card. It says, I wanted to thank the ladies' ministry for the beautiful prayer shawl that they sent to me when my husband, Jason Thornton, was in the hospitals. Last month after suffering a stroke, Jason is the brother of Lee Johns. That prayer shawl means so much. I wrap up in it every day while I do my Bible study. Thank you again so much. And this comes from Brandy. So again, that's uh, Lee Johns' uh, family there, and they just say a big thank you for the prayer shawl ministry. So don't never think that as little as a ministry like that may look, it, it accomplishes big things. It means a lot. Last one, thank you very much for the beautiful prayer shawl and the hats. We cannot express how much your thoughtfulness and kindness means to our family. Sincerely, Mary Ann, Larry, and Heidi Petty. So that comes from the Petty family. So again, a big thank you for, for the ministry there of what the prayer shawl and the um, prayer doll class does. All right, if you would, grab your Bibles. We're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 13 this morning. Luke chapter 13, we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. It reads like this. There were present at that season some who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, like, unless you, repent you will all likewise perish. Or what about those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed? Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he also spoke this parable, saying, A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. And then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, then well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. You can be seated. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I come to you right now and I just um, I want to say thank you for all the things that we don't deserve. Father, thank you for the way that you have, have blessed us. Father, for the way that you take care of us. For the way that you love us. And Father, I know more than ever that we are nothing, Father. Lord, if it were not for Your grace, if it were not for Your mercy, if it were not for Your love, Father, we would be hopeless. And Father, I just pray that every day that goes by that we would recognize that more and more. Father, I want to thank You for the rain that has fell the last few nights, Father. Lord, I want to thank You, um, Lord, that Lord, something that a lot of people overlook. But Father, I just want to say thank You that, um, Lord, You still continue to send rain. Father, thank You for, um, for all of Your creation, Father. Thank You for, uh, Lord, the great ocean that 
displays Your glory, God. Lord, there have been so many that have went to see it and, and some this week that are there now, Father. And Lord, I, I just um, I thank You for all of Your creation, God, and the way that we're able to enjoy it. And Father, I pray that we bring You glory as we enjoy it. Father, I pray this morning for all of my, my family, God. Lord, I pray especially this morning for the, the matriarchs and the patriarchs of this church. Father, the ones that are growing older and the ones that their health is, is failing, God. Father, I know these bodies are cursed and I know that this mortal must put on immortality. Lord, I, I understand that. But Father, it's still tough and Lord, I know that You, you understand it more than ever. You, you lost and sent Your own Son to die on the cross, God. So Father, I, I know that You understand pain. I know that You understand suffering. So Lord, I come and I ask You for mercy on my family. Father, I pray for, for all of the ones that are suffering with whatever sicknesses they're suffering with. Father, some of them with infections, staph infections and C. diff and, and just, Lord, frailty. Father, just old age. And Father, I just pray that... Um, Lord, You would strengthen their bones, that You would heal their infections, that, Father, if it can be Your will, that, Lord, You allow them to live out the rest of their days in this mortal body in peace and comfort and good health. And, Father, I pray most importantly that no matter what happens, that their faith would not fail. Father, I pray that even now in their time of, uh, of suffering, God, that it would be a time that their hope in You increases more and more. Father, I pray right now that through the pain and through the tears that they're able to say, with all certainty that Your promises are true, that their hope is not, uh, Lord, is not in vain. Father, that their faith is still as strong as it's ever been and even stronger because they know in whom they have believed. So Father, I pray for my family right now. I pray for those that are in trials and that are, uh, Lord, that are just, uh, the devil has decided to, Lord, to sift them like wheat. And Father, I pray for, for those this morning, God, that their faith would not fail. And Father, I pray that this would be a time that, that our hope only increases in You, that we cling to You, that we draw close to You, and that we see exactly how much we need You. Father, I pray these trials will do nothing more to us except show us just how cursed this world is and how temporary the things of this world are. Father, I pray that it causes us to chase after You with all of our heart and not waste our life on, on useless things. Father, I pray for the ones that are in mourning this morning, for the ones that, Lord, have lost loved ones or have just went through um, loss of any kind in the last few days or weeks or years, Father. Lord, it's not like uh, the hurt goes away. Father, I pray for my family that's hurting this morning. And Father, I pray, Lord, that a peace that passeth all understanding would be in their hearts. And Father, this morning as we get in Your Word, I just simply ask You to do what You said You would do. You make it accomplish Your purpose. You, you don't let it return back to You void, Father. I pray that whatever reason You have for sending this Word out this morning that is accomplished. Father, I know that I am nothing and You know that I have no ability, that I am no one special. God, I'm an old country boy that, that just barely learned how to read and just barely made it out of high school, Father. But I, I thank You that You're here with me this morning, that You're going you're gonna to do great things through Your Word, through Your power this morning. So Father, I ask You to hear our prayer. Lord, if it can be Your will, give us the desire of our heart in everything that we've asked You for this morning. And Father, I love You and I thank You. I pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In Luke chapter 13... I ended our scripture reading this morning with a parable that um, it reminds me a lot of the parable that we taught on last week, the parable of the sower. It's a parable that reminds me that God has purpose for His Christians that He plants in His vineyard. That when He throws seed and, and when He causes something to grow, that He doesn't just do it so that it'll look pretty. Uh, God, God, don't get me wrong, God's got flowers and God's got things that look pretty, but when God plants a vineyard or an orchard, an orchard or an, and a vineyard were not for the purpose of just looking pretty, right? The purpose of having an orchard is for what? The fruit. And if you have an orchard or a vineyard, what was the purpose of a vineyard? 
It's for grapes. It was for actually making wine. There was a purpose for having these things. And if you are a farmer and you have an orchard and you have a tree, a fruit tree in your orchard that is not producing fruit, will there come a time that you will replace that tree with one that will? Because you didn't put that tree in that orchard just to look pretty. That tree is in that orchard, That those grapes are in that vineyard to produce something for the purpose that He put it in there for. And whenever you go back and look at the parable of the sower from last week, you see that we can draw the same conclusion. When he planted seed and it finally fell on good ground, the good ground here actually grew, produced fruit, some 60, some 100, some 30, but each and every one of them produced the way that they were designed to produce. And in this parable this morning, we're going to see that there is a time coming to where God looks at each and every one of us and He has put all of mankind on this, cre- on this earth to produce fruit for Him. Whether you're a Christian yet or not, you were created in the image of God. You were created to produce fruit for God. And He's coming. And He's looking for that fruit. And either you have this fruit or you don't have this fruit. And this, again, should be some of the scariest verses in the Bible for all of us this morning to give us reason to examine ourselves to see when God comes and He looks at me, what does He see? What does He find as me, as one of His trees in His vineyard? Is He finding the fruit that He's looking for? And how much longer will it be before He looks and He says to the keeper of His vineyard, cut it down. Why should it use up the ground anymore? Sobering words. Very frightening words. But this morning I want to take and look at how we got to this parable to begin with. What happened that brought us here? Just a little bit of background at the end of Luke chapter 12. We're not going to go back and read it. I'll just tell you about it. But basically, Jesus was walking with His disciples and He was telling them, He said, guys, listen, when you see a cloud rising out of the west, you immediately say, there's rain coming. How many of you in the last couple of days looked back off in the distance and you seen a dark cloud and you said, there's a storm coming? Alright? And then he says, and not only that, but when you feel and see a south wind is blowing, you say, it's going to be a hot one today. Or if there is a north wind that comes in, and it, it comes in and it cuts you like a knife, you say, wow, it's going, to be, it's going to be cold for the next day or so because there's a north wind that is coming down. And, and he tells us, he says, listen, you are hypocrites because you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you cannot look around and discern the times that you're living in and all of the spiritual things that are going on around you? You can predict the weather. You can look at the creation in the earth and go, okay, this means it's going to do this, and this means it's going to be like this, and this means it's going to be like that. But I'm not smart enough to look around. And he actually calls us, he says, hypocrites. Hypocrites. You can, but you don't. And then he goes on, he says, listen, God is coming to judge. You can predict the weather and see a storm's coming. But you can't look around this earth and see that a storm of God's judgment is coming. You can't look around and see the tragedies that take place and and all of the things that go on and all of the evil acts that people are doing. You can't look around and you can't be smart enough to look at it and go, there is judgment and it's coming. I ain't got to question it. I ain't even really got to have all the explanations for it. All I got to do is be able to look around. I've been seeing a lot of people post on Facebook this uh, this last week and month. They've been putting on there. They'll say, it's the end of the world as we know it. That's some pretty smart people, right? They can look at the way things are right now and they can honestly look and they can say, it's the end of the world as we know it. You know what they mean when they say that? There's something coming. 
There's a storm on the way. And here's what Jesus ends this thing at the end of chapter 12. He tells them, he says, listen, make every effort along your way to settle with your adversary. Make every effort along the way to settle with him because he's going to drag you to the judge and the judge is going to deliver to you to the officer and the officer is going to throw you into prison. And I tell you, you shall not depart from there until you have paid the very last might. So Jesus ends this thing with his disciples by telling them, judgment is coming, guys. And all you've got to do is look around and you can see that it's on its way. And I tell you, you better be making every effort to make sure that you are ready for this because it's coming whether you like it or not. So when these people heard this, there was this group of people that heard Jesus talking about judgment coming. And they come back, and here's what they said to Jesus in Luke chapter 13, verse 1. It says, There were present at that season some who told Jesus about Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. In other words, here's what happened. There were these, at least somewhat of God-fearing uh, people that were coming to the temple to worship God. Just like you came to church to worship Christ this morning, these people were in the temple. They were bringing their sacrifices. They have their pigeons, their turtle doves, or their, their lambs, or whatever the case may have been. And they're coming in there to worship and while they are in there worshiping and the blood is being offered to cover their sins, the Roman governor at this time sends his soldiers in for whatever reason and he starts slicing people's throats that were in there worshiping. I know that's hard, but that's exactly what happened. He kills them and while they're worshiping, the blood from these worshipers gets mingled with the blood sacrifices that were being offered to God. And these people, they look at this and they literally, they, they just, they can't understand it. This is such a horrible tragedy. I mean, I don't want to scare anybody this morning, but just imagine something like that in this place this morning. How many of you would leave here this morning you would never be the same from something like that, right? Your mind would never be the same. I don't know if you would ever get a handle on it to be able to grasp what happened. How did this take place? We were going to worship. And these people came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, I know you said judgment is coming. And I believe you. I know it is. But, but what, about, what about this tragedy right here? Have you heard about this? And Jesus Answers in verse 2. And he said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? See, basically, Jesus heard the question that has not even been asked yet. The question that's actually being asked right here, they're saying, Jesus, what in the world could these people have done? What sin must they have committed in order to endure and, and, and have, to, have to get that kind of punishment? Jesus said, guys, listen to me. Do you really think for one minute that those people were worse sinners than any others because they suffered such things? And look what he says next. He says, I tell you what? No. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now think about that for just a minute. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Say there are a lot of people who would have thought that, and, and, and I've heard it said, I remember when Katrina came in and wiped out uh, New Orleans. I heard it said, and y'all probably heard it said too, I heard preachers say, that is the judgment of God on the wickedness of New Orleans for their voodoo and their witchcraft and all the things that they practice. You know what Jesus would have said? You think they're any worse sinners than you are? I tell you, no. Or what about the homosexuals that were in their club and, and, and they were practicing in their sexual immorality and then all of a sudden a man comes in and shoots and kills I think of what 
fifties? How many people would have looked at that and said, it's the judgment of God. You know what Jesus would have said? Do you think there are any worse sinners than you are? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. Here's the thing you need to understand. He's not telling you that all of us that are, uh, are in a bad sin in our life are going to suffer some kind of a great tragedy. Is that possible? Yes. Has God used great tragedies in the past to punish sin? Yes. Does every time a tragedy come upon somebody mean that that person was in some kind of great sin? No. Go back and read the book of Job. There are many reasons why tragedies happen in this world. But what Jesus is trying to get across to us today is very simple. He's saying, guys, listen. Don't be surprised and don't be overwhelmed at the fact that a great tragedy has occurred and destroyed sinners. All are sinners. Look what he said. Unless you repent, you will what? All. So who does he include in the box when he says great sinners? Everybody. We're all thrown into the same category of being as a great offense to God because of the lifestyles that we choose and because of the choices that we make. Whether it be the ones we deem as great and, 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 and evil or the little ones that we look at and go, ah, it's not really that big a deal. No matter what it is, the truth of the matter is, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Don't be surprised and don't be, uh, uh, don't be in awe of the fact that sinners have died in a tragedy. It was not because they were greater sinners than anybody else. But I tell you this, if you're going to be surprised at something, be surprised and be in awe at the fact that God has given you one more day. One more hour, one more minute, or even one more second to repent. And Jesus said, listen, unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. You're all included in this category. But when he says likewise, is he saying that unless you repent, a tower is going to fall on you? No. Is he saying that unless you repent, you are going to die? No, because even those who repent are going to die, correct? That's why he does not use the word unless you repent, you will all likewise have a tower thrown on you. Or unless you repent, you will all likewise have your blood mingled with your sacrifices during the worship service. And he don't say unless you repent, you will likewise die. I've known men that got saved this Sunday. I know of one man that comes to my mind right now that got saved on a Sunday and then on Monday the man died. They found him dead. A car had hit him while he was jogging down the road. He literally got saved on Sunday and he died on Monday. Even those who repent die. So what is he trying to get across to us when he says unless you repent you will all likewise He's saying you will perish. The word perish actually comes from a Greek word which means this, to utterly bring to ruin, to completely destroy. He's saying don't be in awe of the fact that somebody died in a tragedy. We are all sinners and the axe is already laid at the root waiting to chop it down, the only thing that is going to make any difference in it at all is that those who repent won't perish. They'll still die. They still may have a tower fall on them. They still may come to church and offer sacrifices and get killed at worship service. We don't know. But one thing that'll be different, if you repent, you won't perish. 
He said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe on Him should not what? Perish. perish but have what? So here you've got two options. You've got perish and you've got everlasting life. If everlasting life is one option, then what does perish mean in the other, other option? To not have everlasting life, but instead to have everlasting, the opposite of life. And what is the opposite of life? Don't be amazed that tragedies happen. Don't be amazed that sinners die in tragedies. Be amazed. Listen to me, guys. Every one of you, be amazed that you still have one more day, one more hour, one more second. That the long suffering and mercy of God is so great that you have not had somebody come in the door yet and mingle your blood with the sacrifices that we offer to Christ. Be amazed that you have not been jogging on the road yet and a car come by and hit you. Be amazed at the very fact that you still have an opportunity and a chance as great a sinner as you are, even as great as any, uh, what, what we would consider in sexual immorality or, uh, I mean, you name the biggest sin you can think of. No matter what you want to name, you'd be amazed at the fact that you still have a chance to be able to repent and not perish. Let's keep reading. He says in verse 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or what about those 18 on whom the tower and Siloam fell and killed? Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? Jesus is making my point very clear. Let me make this, let me turn that around. I'm going to try to make Jesus' point very clear that he's already made clear. And that's that everybody in Jerusalem at that time were on the same level as far as sinners were concerned. The only difference was whether or not they were going to perish or not. And the only difference in whether or not they were going to perish or not was whether or not they had repented or not. We'll get to what that means here in just a minute. He says in verse 5, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So then in verse 6, he brings it to a parable. He also spoke this parable saying, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it, until I fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, then good. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. Let's look at some of the things that we know from this parable. We know that there is a certain man that has a vineyard. This certain man, of course, is God. This vineyard, of course, is the earth. And he has fig trees that are planted that he has planted there for the purpose of producing fruit. So we have God who owns a vineyard and then He has fig trees that are us that are planted to produce fruit. And He's looking for fruit on it. And then in verse 7 we see that there is a keeper of this vineyard. And this keeper is actually pruning trees and he's actually going through and he's trying to help these trees to produce fruit in any way that they can. And He's coming and He's looking for fruit. So when we look at this parable, what are some of the things and some of the conclusions that we can draw about God and what He expects of us as trees in His vineyard? Number one, I got four of them. I'll go through these quickly. Number one, God is looking for fruit. He expects fruit in those who have faith. Listen, be very, very careful that you do not think to yourself for one second that being saved and not perishing means that all I did was just believe on Jesus and nothing ever changed. Yes, don't get me wrong. It is by grace, through faith, and faith alone 
that you are saved. But don't think for one minute that faith is fruitless. The truth of the matter is, genuine faith always produces fruit. If you were to go over to Hebrews chapter 11, and we're not going there, but if you were to go there, you would know that it is the chapter, if we were to give it a title or a label, it would be the chapter of faith. It is the account of all of the people of old that had faith in God. And just about every verse starts out like this. By faith, Noah, this. By faith, Abraham, this. By faith, Abel, this. Or by faith, Sarah, this. And it goes down through a long list of people that had faith. And one of the things that you'll always notice is that there was always fruit that followed their faith. It was by faith and by faith alone. But faith is the full assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Think about it like this. You've heard, some of you have heard this from me before. By faith, Noah, when he was divinely warned of things to come, what was Noah warned of? There's a flood coming. When Noah was divinely warned, he moved with godly fear and he prepared an ark for the saving of his household. How can you look at Noah's life and see that he had genuine faith? Remember, faith is the full assurance of things hoped for. What was Noah's hope? Huh? That he would be saved. And in order for Noah to be saved, he had to believe that the divinely warning that come from God, I'm going to destroy the world with the flood. He believed that, and the evidence of his belief was the fact that he did what? If he didn't build an ark, did he believe the divine warning? Listen, you look around and you see judgment. Here's the reason why Jesus calls us hypocrites. He, it would have been the same way if, if Noah had have done this. If he had have looked around at the evil in that world and said, yep, judgment's coming. Yep, God is going to do what He said He's going to do. There is a flood that's coming. And then Noah sit back in his chair and did absolutely nothing. Would his faith have been genuine? Absolutely not. Did he really believe like he said he believed? Absolutely not. The evidence that he believed was the fact that he prepared an ark. And no matter which story you want to go to in the Bible, every one of them will say the same thing. The evidence of genuine faith is the fact that it produced something in the direction of its hope. It had full assurance of things hoped for based on the evidence of the thing not seen, and that is God. They looked around, they saw all the evidence of who God was, of what God did, that God was indeed who He said He was, that He would indeed do what He says He's going to do, and based on the full assurance of hope and the evidence of things unseen, He moved with godly fear. So Noah moved with godly fear. He prepared an ark, genuine faith. Abraham went out when he was called, not knowing where he was going because he believed that when God said, get out of your country, get out of your family, get out of your riches and your things and come to a land that I'm going to show you and I will bless you and I will be a blessing to those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and I will make a great nation out of you and I will give you uh, 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 the children that the sands of the sea don't even compare to. He said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And the Bible says that Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. So Abraham believed God. You know how we know Abraham believed God? He went out. Faith always has fruit that follows. For those of you that say, I have faith and say, I believe in Jesus Christ, you are to be like Noah. You've heard the divine warning. You've heard God say, judgment is coming. And only those who repent and are in Christ will be saved. And you say, I believe. But yet there is no new creation. Now, I'm not talking about stumbles. Don't get me wrong this morning. I'm talking about lifestyles. And we all stumble. We're all sinners. But I'm talking about people who are building an ark. 
I'm talking about people who are building the ark of Jesus Christ and their life, when you look at it, you can see that they are repenting and that they are turning from the things of old and they are going after the things of God. And I'm telling you right now, listen to me, I don't care if it's you or your kids, Jesus gave us this to scare us. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. The fear of the Lord is a good thing. The axe is laid at the tree. And parents, I'm telling you about your children and adults. I'm telling you about yourselves. And I'm telling me, to me, that unless you repent, you will perish. God is looking for fruit. And the fruit will be evidence of the fact that you have repented. He says that those who are in Christ will be saved. When he says that, he means that those who are producing the fruit and they're living the lifestyle of Christ, they still make mistakes and they they still stumble. But God is looking for fruit and He expects it. Second thing. Another point we draw from this parable is that God is long-suffering and He is patient while He expects fruit. Look at it again. Verse 6 through 8. He also spoke this parable. He said, A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit. He's looking for fruit, and he found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. The next thing we see is that his patience and long-suffering is great even while he is looking for fruit. He came looking for fruit. He found none. He had every reason to cut it down right then, did he not? But that's not what he did. He said, I came back first year, didn't find none. Came back the second year, didn't find none. Came back the third year, didn't find none. I'm reaching a point every time I come back and look and find none, I'm getting that much closer to saying, get it out of here. Why should it use up the ground? I'll replace it with one that will produce fruit. God is very patient. He is long-suffering. I want you to look with me if you would at Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 30 through 32. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 30 through 32. Listen to what it says. He says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all of your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, says the Lord. Therefore, turn and live. What did God say? He said, I have no pleasure in you perishing. God's not up there going, I can't wait till I can cut you down. He's up there instead pleading with you through people like me and through the prophets of old. And He's pleading with people like me through the Word and through other Uh, inspired speakers of His Word, and He's reminding us, saying, i got no pleasure in you perishing. But if you don't repent and you don't turn back to Me, I'm sorry, you are going to ruin. You're going to perish. And He says, turn and live. I am long-suffering. I'm looking. I'm trying. I'm sending people. I'm speaking to you. I'm pleading with you. I'm begging with you. Surely if you're smart enough to look up at the cloud and say there's rain coming, then surely you're smart enough to be able to look up and look around and go, judgment is coming. And I need to turn and get myself a new heart and get myself a new spirit and then I will live eternally, which is His promise to me. 
So we see again that God is long suffering and He is patient while expecting fruit. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 is another scripture that comes to mind when I think about this. He said, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. For a long time in Noah's day, he looked around and the book of Peter actually tells us, I think it was Second Peter, I can't remember exactly where, but the book of Peter actually tells us that God patiently waited for them to repent. And yet the whole time he waited, he says there was only a few that were saved. And you know how many there were that were saved? Noah and his family. There were eight. But for 120 years, he patiently waited and Noah preached and he preached and he preached and he preached and he preached, judgment is coming. And they did not listen. God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. And He is waiting and He's preaching and He's hoping. The third thing that we see from this um, parable, we see that God's patience and long-suffering, that it has a limit. He is patient. He is long-suffering. But don't get it twisted. One day He will come to a point, and we don't know when that day it is, there will come a point to where He will lay the axe to the roots and He will say, My Spirit is done striving. Look what He said again in Genesis 6.3. The Lord said, My Spirit shall not strive with man forever, for He is indeed flesh. In other words, you know what He's saying there? I know that there are going to be many that are so fleshful that they are not going to turn around. I cannot strive with them forever because they are not going to turn to Me. I will wrestle for a while. I will. I'll fight. I'll plead with. I'll beg with. I'll send preacher after preacher after preacher. I'll teach and I'll tell them all about my good news in the gospel of Jesus Christ and I'll teach them all about my coming wrath and I'll even reveal it to them and show them where they can see it. But I'm not going to strive with them forever. There is coming a point to where I am done with this. Listen, a tower may not fall on you and kill you. You may not be slaughtered in a worship service, but you can guarantee this, death is coming to all of us one way or the other. It's coming to each and every one of us and just like the horror of this end took these people by surprise and they were never the same from the tragedy they experienced, he says this, if you don't repent and bear fruit, your end is going to be so horrible. Not your death, not the fact, don't be surprised that a tower fell or that they were slaughtered in a worship service. I'm talking about what it means to perish. If you think this took them by surprise, unless you repent, you have no idea the surprise that's coming your way. You know, the Bible actually tells us that eye hath not seen and ear hath not heard and it's never entered into the heart of man the thing that things that God has prepared for you. In other words, there is no way that your mind can comprehend the greatness of God's goodness, right? If that's true, do you know the opposite is also true? There's no way that your mind can comprehend the greatness of God's wrath. And I know that's such an unpopular subject, but you do know that that's part of the Bible, right? I would be a terrible, terrible man of God and preacher to come in here and preach to you every morning and not bring things like this up. But I love you enough and I believe it with all of my heart to come in and try to give you fair warning so that you can examine yourself. I'm not trying to make somebody question their salvation this morning, but let me tell you what the Apostle Paul said. He said, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. In other words, it is a good thing for you to examine yourself and ask myself the question, am I building an ark? If I'm not building an ark, then I have reason to ask myself, do I need to repent before I perish? He said, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. 
There are too many preachers out there today trying to preach people's assurance into heaven when the truth of the matter is that they may even be hell bound. And that preacher's up there going, don't you doubt your salvation? Don't you doubt this? Don't you question this? Uh -uh, I'm not going to tell you that. I'm telling each and every one of you this morning, look at yourself. You examine yourself. Are you in the faith? Is there fruit coming from your life as a Christian? Do you see a change that is taking place? Not are you perfect, not do you have it all together, but is there a change? And if there's not, if you can't even see the beginning of a change, if you can't even feel the desire for a change, I'm telling you there's something wrong. And Jesus would tell you today, repent, turn away from it, recognize it, and just turn to God and say, God, I want to live. He said, get yourself a new heart. What does it mean if somebody says, get yourself something? It's available. It's here. All you have to do is get it. You know, I used to love um, going to my grandmother's house, um, my, my Nana Betty as I called her. I don't know if any of y'all got a Nana or not, but I had a, I got a Nana Betty. When I get to Nana Betty's house, she, every time you go in, she's going to say, go on in the kitchen there and get you something to eat. Get you some of this out of there. And, and then she'd fix me some, I loved her macaroni and cheese. Nana Betty fixed the best macaroni and cheese you ever put in your mouth. She fixed the macaroni and cheese and she'd have some in the refrigerator. She'd say, go on in there and get you some of that, uh, some of that macaroni and cheese. You know why she tell me to go in there and get it? Because she knew it's available. All I got to do is go get it. And God is saying to each and every one of you, yes, if you don't repent, you will perish. But get yourself a new heart. Get yourself a new spirit. It is available to you through the gospel of Jesus Christ. All you but do is believe with all of your heart. And if you believe, it will be evident by the fact that your life follows after your full assurance of hope. He says, all who are in Christ shall be saved. And if you believe that with all your heart, you will be in Christ. And the evidence of being in Christ is that your life follows after Him. So again, God's patience and long-suffering has a limit. Don't let His wrath surprise you terribly. The last thing we draw from this parable is that if we repent, and if we turn to God, He will help us bear fruit. See, the scary thing about a, about a message like this is you hear me saying all this and then you look at yourself and you go, I don't know how. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't really know what to do. I don't really know what to say. I don't know, I don't know what, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Listen to what He says in the parable again. In verse, um, start in verse 7 again. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, by the way, the keeper is Jesus Christ, but Jesus has a tool that he uses. He says to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree. I've been long-suffering. I've been patient. Anybody in here he's been long-suffering and patient with before? Maybe right now? He said, I've been long-suffering, I've been patient, I've been looking for fruit for three years. Don't find any. Cut it down. He's ready right now. Right now. He's not willing that any should perish, but he's looked long enough, and he's ready to cut it down right now. But then the keeper of the vineyard says this in verse 8. He says, but he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also. What is Jesus at the right hand of the Father for right now? Why is He not here with us? Why is He at the right hand of the Father? He's interceding for us, right? He's up there going, God, I've been there. I know what it's like. I understand their form. I understand what it is to be flesh. I know what it feels like to be tempted. I know the struggle that they fight with. I know it brought me to sweating drops of blood. It brought me to crying drops of blood. It, it brought me to a place of, of begging You to deliver me from this cup if it can be Your will. God, I understand. And that's what you're reading right here. He says, Sir, please, just a little more time. Just a little bit more. Sir, let it alone this year also until I can dig around it. 
fertilizer. Here's what he's saying. I'm going to give you everything you need to produce the fruit that I'm looking for. This ain't rocket science. I'm going to give you everything you need to live the life that I am calling you to live. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to put people in place to guide you. I'm going to put you in home groups and Sunday schools and I'm going to put you in the Word and I'm just going to show you little by little. I'm not coming as long as I come and just find a fig. Notice what he said. He said, for three years I came seeking fruit and I found what? Listen, I'm not expecting you to be full bloom right now but I need to be able to see a fig. I need to be able to see something. If we will repent and will turn to God, He will help us bear fruit. He says, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and I fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, then good. That's a good thing. But if it don't, after that, guess what? Cut it down. And let me tell you something, guys. This ain't just to scare nobody. This is to be honest with you. Listen, you can look at the sky and you can see a storm's coming. You know what I'm telling you is the truth. Once it's cut down, there is no more opportunity to repent. You think it's a tragedy to look at things where people get shot and people come in churches and kill people and people walk in schools and kill children and, and you think it's a tragedy and you think it's extraordinary, sinful, they must have done something. No, I tell you, they are no worse sinners than anybody else in this world. None. But unless you repent, the axe is at the tree. And unless you start bearing fruit of some kind, in genuine faith, cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? My prayer for you this morning is seriously to examine yourself. Again, this, this ain't about trying to scare you. I remember the night that God revealed this very thing to me. Listen, I was leading worship in the pulpit every Sunday morning. And yet, you get me out of town and you get me away from the people that, that, that held me accountable. I was living my life, I'm talking about. I'm talking about there wasn't no fruit. There wasn't no fruit in my life. And God brought me to a place in my bedroom down on Crooked Hill Road in a corner crying at midnight. Yeah, and I don't cry. I don't say that boastfully. I just, I don't. I'm a very hard-hearted, unemotional person. I hate that about me. I don't like that. But I am. But that night God brought me to my, in a fetal position in a corner of my bedroom crying my eyes out because I knew this right here. Here's what God was telling me. I'm done. I'm fixing to cut it down. And I found myself in that corner and I remember asking God, God, please, please, if you can just forgive me, I'll live my life for you. I will turn this thing around and I will be what you have commanded me to be. I may not get it all right. I may only have one fig when you come looking, but I'm going to have something. I'm going to have something for you. And I can remember... Gabriel was shutting down at the time. It was where I was working. I'd been traveling a lot. They shut down and I can remember I told God, I said, God, I'll tell you what, in just a few weeks, I'm fixing to be starting a new job. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, God. When I get down to this job down here, I'm going to, I'm going to start it over. I, I'm going to, I'm going to be everything that I'm supposed to be. I, I'm going to lay it out there clean. I'm going to let everybody know who I am and what I stand for. And I heard God say, no. No, you're not. You're going to start it right now. You're going to start it at Gabriel. And that next day, this is the truth. I, I didn't hear an audible voice. It was just something that I knew I had to do if I was going to be serious about repenting and turning my life over to Christ. And that next day, I went back to work at Gabriel and I started going around to people that looked at me like I was stupid and apologizing to them and telling them that I've not been the person that, that I claim to be, that, that, I, that, that I have been living in sinful lifestyles and that I'm sorry. And I want to ask them, 
to forgive me for, for looking like I bear fruit. Listen, the maddest I've ever seen Jesus be other than whipping people out of the temple was when He was walking down the road one day and He was hungry and He saw a fig tree that was full bloom and it appeared to have fruit. And He went up to eat the fruit off this tree and you know what He found? There was no fruit. And He was so angry with that tree because it looked like it was supposed to have fruit. Are y'all following me here? It looked like it was supposed to have fruit. And when he got to it, there's no fruit. It was not what it said it was. And he got up to this thing and he said, wither up and die. And never bear fruit again. And the disciples testified and they said they'd never seen anything like it. The tree literally withered up right there at its spot and it never bore fruit again. If there's one thing that makes God angry, is someone that walks around appearing to be full of fruit. But when you get up to this thing, there's no fruit on it. I went back to that Gabriel that next day and I told every one of them that I was that tree that looked like I was supposed to have fruit. Leading worship, praying, being in the church. I didn't miss a service. I didn't. But my life was not a life lived for the glory of God and bearing fruit for God. And I can remember going around to each and every one of them. I said, I'm going to give my testimony this Sunday morning. I'm going to be baptized for the remission of my sins. I want you all to come. And that next Sunday morning, uh, we were in this old association building down on the bypass down here. And I can remember being up on that stage that Sunday morning. The service had already started. And, and one of my black friends, Ricky Randolph, he, t he once told me one time, he said, now listen to me, black folks don't start on time. They don't ever start on time. I sung in, in their churches a lot back then. And I can remember I was already up on the stage and about that time the service had already started and I looked up and through the door come all my friends from Gabriel, the majority of whom were African American and they come walking through the door of this place late, but they were there right on time for me to give my testimony and they all sit down in the pew. Some of y'all remember that. Some of y'all can, can remember that day. I'm trying to tell you something. The message that Jesus has given you this morning is very simple. If you're not producing fruit, if you can't examine yourself and you can't see faith evident in your life, He's telling you this morning, you're not worse sinners than anybody else, but the axe is already laid to the tree. And if He don't find fruit, how much longer do you have before He says, Cut it down, and there is no more chance for you to bear fruit for God. If you don't repent this morning, you will perish. And the tragedy of perishing is so much worse than any tragedy that you will ever see in any other place or ever hear of. It's a tragic thing that five police officers lost their life this weekend in Dallas, right? You better say, right? It is a tragic thing that that took place. But let me explain something to you. Don't be amazed at the tragedy of that, but instead be amazed at the very fact that you still have one more day, one more hour, one more second before God says, cut it down. Why should it use up the fruit, the ground? If y'all would stand this morning, whatever the Lord has spoke to you, I don't care if it takes you having to go to your work tomorrow and proclaim it or if you've got to step out of your pew and be able to say, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. But I know by looking at the world, judgment is coming. And I don't want to perish. And if that's all you have to do this morning, that's not a bad thing. Be bold enough and believe it enough to be able to step out and say, God, if you can just forgive me, I'll live for you. I'll follow you with all of my heart. I repent today. I'm going to bear fruit for you. If that's you this morning, I encourage you to come. This morning is the morning of salvation. It's your morning. Decide to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow
promise I'm going to get it all right. I don't know that I'm going to have it all together. I don't know that, that, that I'll be able to even have more than a fig for you by this time next year. But I'm going to get in it and I'm going to walk with all of my heart. I'm going to give you my everything. I'm talking to somebody this morning. When the Bible says that few are they who enter in, but many are the ones that find the way of destruction, I know I know I'm talking to somebody this morning. And you know what? As hard as it seems to you to make a decision like confess Him before men, as hard as that seems to you, that is not a hard decision to do once you actually just do it. It's a decision that everything just lets go and all the burdens are gone and literally you walk away feeling like everything has been lifted off of you because you finally made the decision